So thank you so much. Um, you want to do a little bit of uh, tissue and eye tissue and clay combs that we published earlier this year, and then where we're moving into immune cell subtypes with uh, different methods. I'm fortunate to work at the Medical University of South Carolina with two colleagues, Anand Mehta and Peggy Angel, and we kind of have a matrix group where we collaborate on all kinds of glycan assays um, and studies. We've pretty much come up with a platform on this, and you'll see the technology in a minute, um, but everything on the far left for the sample, seems like if we can get it on the slide, we've got a workflow to get the data back off uh, using uh, different glycosidases, mass spectrometry, uh, and then the data analysis. Um, such that pretty much whatever we can get out of the clinic, we've got an assay for now. And so um, that's been a goal over the last five years of, for, out of the three of us developing different technologies. And then you're going to see in the next session, single cells, just from Dr. Maida. Um, so this is where we started, particularly with uh, tissue. This is a, um, a, col a colorectal cancer that came from the same biopsy where it's normal on the right, turning into a villous adenoma that then turns into an um, invasive adenomucinous carcinoma. It's a very rich uh, glycomic tissue, and we've always seen this with the, the end-link gly glycan profiling. Um, very robust colon uh, images, and it's not random. That's the part, it still fascinates me every day. There's just absolutely nothing random about the way these glycans distribute. And so it's, it's a very powerful spatial way. This particular tissue, we can get 174 compositions, structural compositions. Lord knows how many, there's so much fucose and outer arm going on in this. I mean, the number, I have no idea to get exact number, um, but I'm sure it's in the several hundreds. Just briefly, um, they're not in the title, I've been working with Stacy Malaker with the, on the O-glycan side, she's been using those mucinase O-glycoproteases and using again some of our favorite glyco tissues, the mucinous uh, colon tissue. Um, this has been submitted and so I was doing the imaging and then she's doing the LCMS to do the peptide identification. And what's shown up there are some MUC2 glycopeptides. In the paper, she's got about 96% coverage of the entire molecule. Uh, there's so much of it present. But what we've seen, with, with, and these are glycopeptides, is the distribution's phenomenal. That as you add uh, galactose, and this is, this is all the same peptide from MUC2, but as you add galactose uh, to the GALNAC, Notice how it shifts, and so it's the kind of thing you just wouldn't see it with any other method, the, this distribution and change on the O-linked. So in progress. Briefly, if, if um, people haven't seen this before, um, the beauty of this is we start with FFPE tissue blocks right out of pathology. So it's the best tissue you can get. The, we prep it a lot like um, you would do if you're going to do immunohistochemistry. So you got to de-wax, um, do the xylenes, get it prepped up, and instead of doing the antibodies, that's when we spray the enzyme. Um, specifically, our um, Pengase F prime from Enzyme Scientific, that we've been using for the last 12 years, uh, which will cleave the glycans, of course, and then we use the mass spec to, to well, we'll get there in a second. Part of the platform angle, change the enzyme, change the signal. So we've been doing a lot of this type of work. A lot of times we can do it sequentially uh, in many different com combinations. Um, we're primarily using Bruker instruments. Um, so we are lasering across the tissue, collecting spectra at, at each location. That's all accumulated, accumulated uh, with the software. And essentially at each peak, there'll be an intensity profile that's averaged out, but then you'll get a heat map for every one of the, the locations. And that's the image that you're showing. We, can use, we, we are putting the colors on it, uh, but this would be a complex piece of pancreas with all kinds of things going on. And again, nothing random about how these distribute. So that's how we make the image. Um, 
as I mentioned, we, this is all published and it's just a, a lot of data. Um, that we had tissue microarrays and then full block tissue that eventually uh, this enterprising student who's now a postdoc, Elizabeth Wallace, turns out she loves data. That's what she, we discovered during her PhD. So she had a field day. So um, there was a lot of data that was generated and she wrote most of the, the program she used in R to, to look at the complexities. Um, there were 15 different types. Um, in general, if, if we were doing the bookkeeping, the, the buy and tenor area with or without the core fucose wins every time. This is just abundance in almost any tissue we look at except one. And we'll let people, most people will know it if they think about it, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, but almost, yeah, we'll see in a second. Um, and that's, so we, within the paper, um, there are 16 or 15 supplemental figures for each organ, tumor versus normal. Um, this is just kidney, because kidney's my other favorite glycomic tissue, very distinct for tubules and, and uh, glomeruli. It's all deposited on Metaspace online. You can get all the images, all the pictures, uh, all the data. And then we also were working with Kyoko. Um, well, actually, I talked, I probably talked to her more than the second glycome conference here. Um, so kind of set up the co collaboration even through the pandemic. Uh, so we've linked the, the structural IDs to the Glycosmos database also. So trying to get it integrated and accessible. Brains would be the other organ that we just, we just didn't have, not a lot of um, tissue in the lab where you have normal and tumor on the same block. Because not a lot of operations on normal brain. So, but we did eventually get uh, some tissues and we got a large study of uh, glioma coming. But those three glycans, the, the, the MAN5 and those two um, small uh, bisecting glycans, there's no other tissue we've ever seen that looks like this. When you look at the abundance in the spectrum, I can pick it out anytime. Um, and the com almost complete lack of sialation, except around blood vessels and ducts, ductal structures. Um, and so that's been reported. That isn't, you know, multiple groups have seen that. And what's fascinating is it seems to go all the, all the way down evolution also. We essentially see the same thing in zebrafish, the same type of profiles. So we're gonna uh, try to add in the data we have for the brain into that data. It, it's extensible uh, in Metaspace. So we can upload that stuff without actually having to publish it in the, more as an archival type thing. So we were still looking at many, many different types of tissues. Um, again, so if FP is your source, we have lots of options. Um, but I want to end or want to move toward what we've been doing with uh, the tertiary lymphoid structures or immune clusters that you find in the tumor microenvironment uh, of tissues. Um, if, if I went back to that colon that I started with, uh, I didn't have a pointer, but you'd see little black holes in the data. There's a lot going on in this tissue, but there's these little spaces on the, around the tumor. And if you look at the H&E that was underneath it, there's immune clusters. And we're like, where's the glycans, of all things? Um, and so we've been looking at uh, a classic uh, TLS, generally has a B cell core surrounded by different types of T cells. Um, you see this a lot in, in the single cell RNA-seq studies now. It never really occurred to me because we were always looking at tumor or stroma and different things. There's so much else going on in these tissues that eventually kind of hit me in the head like, why aren't we looking at these immune clusters? Um, and, and sometimes we weren't seeing them, sometimes we weren't looking for them, but it wasn't until the pandemic and we had some autopsy tissues uh, from lung. This would be early patients and early in the pandemic. And we started looking and you, you could start picking out with just standard immunohistochemistry, some very specific glycan patterns that would co-localize with these different lymphoid structures. And of course, these COVID things were active crime scenes. It's not a question of, is the immune system active in this tissue? Yeah, it was killing people, literally. And so um, 
So activity and then why can't expression was, was the theme of that. But we did have a bunch of prostate tissues and this was one, uh, fortunately it worked. Um, it's like, how can I not see that with this N-glycan imaging? If they're present, um, we should be able to see it. Well, we did, uh, but originally we didn't because we weren't looking for it until we started doing the co-localization type study. We looked subsequently across uh, over 50 tissues, but this, well, I'll show you something in a second. Um, the question was, well, you could be asking, well, what are those? You know, what's the immune cell subsets here? Um, so coincidentally, over the last three or four years, there's a nice MALDI immunohistochemistry approach where you can do multiplex antibodies uh, to all these CD markers, but it uses a peptide as a reporter. So we can use it, it gets the same resolution. It's a really handy way of looking at what's present. Um, again, the three of us uh, worked on this with uh, uh, Peggy. So here's another prostate tissue. Notice the little blue dots uh, where the immune clusters are. If we did the amogen on that, you can get a really nice um, profile. The red is uh, CD20, so the B cell center surrounded by a green T cell core of classic TLS, and we can light up the glycan. Um, the little spot on the left that's the tumor, notice there's a red dot essentially missing. If you did the co-localization, we see this again and again and again, location matters. And so it seems to be a lot of times, it isn't 100%, but the closer the TLS is to the tumor, the, the less likely it is to have glycan expression. And so we've looked at this across um, 41 different prostate tissues. And of all these, out of all those 41, we have no, we have notable, seeable uh, immune clusters, only 10 of the tissues could you actually get a glycan signature from these TLSs. And so it's a pretty finite glycome that's associated with these. Um, it isn't, again, random. It seems very specific. When they are there, it, it falls within one or two classes. Um, we have published this already with a, a colon study. Um, it does tend to track the more severe the tumor was, the, the more likely it was that we could start seeing uh, glycan expression of that. We're also working on this in pancreas, uh, kidney, and breast, as well as prostate. And so we're working on a couple papers in that space. And now to set up uh, my colleague uh, in the next session. Um, he just recently mentored a student who graduated about a month ago, uh, Jake Dressman, who's essentially the idea was do, do our antibody arrays that on and developed and do with immune cells. And so essentially um, that, that worked very well. He published it. We actually did it. He did it with the uh, silic acid stabilization strategies too. So we had all this bookkeeping. And then he developed a new laser. Death star joke. Anyway, the, essentially we got flow on a stick. That was the concept, so I, there, it wasn't like we had to invent the antibodies for CD4 or CD8 or anything that's used in flow cytometry. You just had to find the ones that didn't mind being stuck on a slide. And so it worked out, it's very robust workflow. And then um, with a collaborator in the prostate space, I had these baseline studies that were done for a prostate cancer um, What's the, what's the right word? They were monitoring for 25 years looking for development of prostate cancer. So they were doing uh, serum isolates every five years, but at the first baseline they did PBMCs. And so these were all men from San Antonio, multiple races, it was about 24 years ago, and they did not have cancer. And these are probably 40 year old-ish people. Um, it doesn't mean they were healthy, but they didn't have cancer. So we randomly looked at 30 uh, of these PBMCs and they went through the CD4 and CD8, as well as actually CD19, which you see in a second. And this just blew me away. This was just, this isn't subtle. I mean, the red being the, the higher expressing. So in general, CD4s have a lot more uh, ranched and the CD8s have a lot more biantenary. Now you can see there's, if you start looking, you can see that not everybody's, you know, we are all snowflakes on the immune system. 
but this, is, this strikes me as a code. There's a, there's a code here. CD4s are supposed to look a certain way. CD8s are supposed to look a certain way. Guess what? CD19s look a certain way. Now, this is just structural class. These aren't the individuals. Um, but it just isn't subtle when you start looking at the glycome across this. And the fact that we did it at 30 patients. It wasn't a one-off. We've got it teed up where we can just keep doing more and more and more of these samples. There's actually 5,730 more no, I'm sorry, 4,790. Anyway, there's a lot more left in this cohort um, that, that we can keep going on. And with that, that's where I'm going, um, working on grants and different strategies. Uh, again, going from the tissue, because actually now when we're looking at the tissue, those TLSs, I can pretty much call what the cell type is before we even do the antibody. It's so specific to the cell type with the glycan. And so, of course, we still do the antibody. But, um, so we're going from tissue to peripheral immune cells. Um, and then you're gonna see this single cell platform discussed in the next section that also just, is just gonna be fascinating. And that's why, again, it's a, it's a platform, flow on a stick. There's so many more antibodies we can stick on here uh, to, to look, at the, look at the glycosylation of the different immune cells. Um, working with a, a large pancreatic cancer group. So we're gonna start getting into TILs that are coming from the organ association right at the time of uh, surgery. Of course, things like CAR T cells are just made for this uh, type of approach. Um, and then we're working with um, Amergen and some collaborators at Stanford. So let's, let's try to do this, get some glycan targeted antibody panels that we can do that, add that spatial component along with the molecular characterization. And then lastly, I'm working with a group that we think this is a great way to start looking at immunotherapy responses in, in the, the tumor microenvironment. And with that, um, acknowledge a lot of people in the lab, uh, mentioned my colleagues. Uh, we're fortunate to work with Bruker, uh, who helps to sponsor a center of excellence in the human glycome um, and clinical glycomics. And go, go glycans. I'm on time. Very nice talk. I have a question. So the ability to test these uh, immune cells, glycosylation, you can do it also at the tissue level for isolated immune cells? Or um, this is only circulating? So, so we haven't done the middle yet, right? So the, the, the FFPE is easy because it's trapped. And mm -hmm. so we can at least, we can do all the immunohistochemistry and do all the methods and, you know, we can do that and co-localize it really nicely. Um, the PBMC is, of course, circulating. So we do not have the, you know, we would have to do the, the we have to partner with the people that are doing the tills, essentially, that are isolating at the time of surgery and culturing out those. And, and we're, we've got a nice cancer center, and, and we've got some, a really good colleague that's working on that with us. And so we just haven't made that. That would be my dream cohort, right? PVMCs from the patient, the tissue, and get the active tills out of the same person and compare what you can see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Richard, nice talk. <clears throat> have you looked at the different subtypes of macrophages, or have you polarized PBMCs, or are these just plain PBMCs? Yeah, so we're 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 getting there. It, it's it's. Uh, I've been on a tour the last year and a half, trying to make myself into a functional. Let's, well, functional is not the right word. Comp. Mm, well, then, yeah. No more immunology. Um. I, it's hard to find an immunologist that works on all of them, right? It's I mean, they all have their own, yes. literally, cell yes. of choice. And so it, it's tough. But yes, we, we have, we're getting more in the macrophage with the tissue component right now and doing that. We've got some nice data and different, especially kidney, where we're getting into that space. 
but we're just, that's the, you know, and put on other antibodies, you know, addition onto the, the th so we can do it. We know the antibodies are there. It's just, you know, coming attraction. Yeah, because we've done some simple studies, just lectin arrays, and we see big differences in the expression. I, I'm anticipating they're going to be very specific also. It seems to me the immune system, it almost has to have its own signature on the glycan level because it doesn't want to start attacking itself. I mean, we know it can do that, but it's not really designed to do that. And it seems like the, the glycans are telling each other, stay away, don't touch me, or yeah, I am your partner. Thanks, uh, Rick. Amazing to see all these pictures with this high resolution of glycans and specificity layers. And I just wonder then, how is this all regulated? Have you looked into how transcriptomics is dictating this or metabolomics? Or? Um, just on me, no. Um, we're, we've, got, we've got some fascinating things coming out with the Stanford collaborators who are looking at decidua um, and, the, and that, that regulation of that placental interface. It, it's something of all the tissues, you know, usually I'm doing how many thousands of thousands of tumors, but that placenta signature at gestation week changes, it's like a, you want to talk about a glycan code, you can see the program, right? It's just, it's this one and it switches and it, you, it, there's a developmental glycan code there. That's the closest I've gotten. Um, Anand's working with different people, you know, so yeah, so you can ask Anand. 